journey with Judy. Honest, open, transparent. It's hot. There's no such thing as I almost just said to Dave, we can't start now, but I have no choice in the matter, do I? We got to go. We got to go. We're going. You are journeying with Judy this morning, who's bawling her eyes out, um, as usual, just in pure gratitude and praise. And the reason I'm saying that is because Joel Olstein. do you ever listen to him? I love him. He's so perfect. I want to push him and his wife right off the stage. But anyway, um, he was saying, like, don't be taking your problems to God. He already knows them. Take your praise to God. So I'm praising God uh, for the fact that I did not get on an airplane yesterday and fly to Arizona and kill my oldest son, Carter, because I absolutely would have would have done that. Maybe if it wasn't for God's grace, maybe a portion of that had to do with the parenting class I took last week about the teenage brain. And here's the gig, friends. I thought I had it all covered. Carter signed a college contract with Bob and I, and that contract was not to control my son, our son. It was to minimize the risks involved with being an 18-year-old young man making decisions that could clearly not only be irreversible, but be life-changing um, in a potentially negative way for him. So I'm telling you, Dave is a new parent. He does not know this yet. I mean, his biggest thing is to try to keep Avery happy for, and he can just actually put her in a room and close the door. <laughs> exactly. He's hoping she's eating and sleeping. My hopes for my son are far different. Um, but anyway, so we thought we had it all covered with this college contract. One of the stipulations or whatever, one of the things he agreed to was a, a line in the contract that said, student may not incur additional debt, meaning loans or credit cards or things of that nature, without prior consent with a parent. So we got a phone call, I don't know, the, the night before last, that said, hey, great news, I know who I'm living with next year, and I am. I signed a lease, and I'm. they're going to send you whatever the guarantor thing is. Okay, the guarantor thing is, Dave, guarantees that they get paid, I'm the guarantor thing. So, I said to Carter, Dad and I will look at it, but you know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I can't believe you signed something, knowing that, Dave, don't you know that if you sign something, anything that you sign, there's a grace period, right? Sure. Is that standard operating procedure? Okay, except in Arizona, we'll talk about that in a minute. So I assume, no problem, grace period, I'll you know, sit down the following day, review everything, and make sure that what my son signed is not a problem. Okay. Yesterday was a roller coaster ride of emotions. I truly, with God as my witness, was on the phone from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. The problem for you listeners is that was the time that I would be preparing my show. So my show today is about what happened yesterday, which, Dave, it generally is anyway about what happened in the week before. Okay. I started off in a state of absolute panic. I usually go right from zero to wide open, Dave, like from I'm totally calm to I'm freaking out. And here's why. As I read a 41-page lease, Dave, I, I never signed anything that's 41 pages. I don't think so. But anyway. 41 page lease that my son signed committed him to things that I know that he did not read. And number one, if he didn't read, if he did read it, there is no way that he processed through the ramifications of what it is that he was signing. Just to tell you, Dave, one of the things he signed said clearly, you are responsible to find a guarantor of the commitment which, friends, was $850 per month. He's 18. He has no job and no income. Okay, that was the monthly rent for one bed. Hi, it gets better. One bed in an apartment, one bed. And it said if if I don't guarantee the funds, so if you don't have a guarantor, then you cannot move in, but you are still committing by signing this to pay for 12 months starting next year. Okay. Listeners to Journey with Judy, how many of you know you're, what you're doing next week, next month, next year? My son has made a commitment that starts next August for the following year. 
Oh, yes. Okay, I plan on being dead. Bob and I always say we plan on being dead by then. However, I was on the phone starting with this organization simply saying, hey, guys, just so you know, my kid is not signing. My kid is not going to be held accountable. I am absolutely not signing this document. I don't care that it's an amenity, rich, high rise for my son's highfalutin lifestyle. Um, but Carter goes, but mom, it has a pool on the top. Well, it should. <laughs> It, it has a fitness center, and it has this, and it has that. Anyway, starting with the organization that I really do believe, and I, I am, they are not done with Judy Hare, they totally prey on these young kids. I mean, Carter was saying, Mom, you don't understand. I had to sign yesterday because there was no more rooms left. There was 594 beds at the minimum $850 per bed. Now, I don't want you to think my kid's dumb. I want you to realize he's 18 and his brain is not fully developed. I, my friends, am his frontal lobe. So from the realtor, from the hub, which is the organization that did this, to realtors, to the Secretary of State website, to Southern Arizona Legal Advice, the Office of Legislation, Arizona Department of Real Estate, an attorney, the Arizona Realtors Association, and finally, ultimately, his recruiting coach, who I did not want to bother, but I absolutely needed his intervention to the team chaplain who clearly prayed us through the entire situation. So this roller coaster ride of emotions where I was supposed to be praising God, according to Joel Olstein, <laughs> praising God for this problem. Um, the bottom line is I went from being so open-minded to so honest about what I think my kids shouldn't have done to frustrated, upset, angry, raging, crying. You know, I, I heard recently that it cost $241,000 to raise someone until they're 18. Dave, I wish they could calculate how many tears you shed from zero to 18. I'm thinking that. So, but there was a saint who said that we should put them in a cage until they're 18 years old and then take them out. The fact is, is my kid turned 18 and he signed this document while 18. But in the midst of all of this insanity, friends. I also heard a statistic that said moms are the happiest when they are doing what it was I was doing from nine until three yesterday afternoon. You are journeying with Judy right here on Lake 96.1 and I'm glad I'm not crying anymore. We'll be back. Okay, so I'm definitely a train wreck this morning because I gave you all the people I talked to, but I didn't tell you why. The reason that I talked to all of those people is because it was perfectly made perfectly clear that there was no reneging on this agreement. There is no grace period. There's nothing that protects a lease to a landlord, want a leasee to a landlord once they sign a document in the state of Arizona. So my son is now committed to paying starting next year, $850 per month, which really ends up being 900 and some dollars per month, which all the costs they didn't tell him about. And the 24 hour window that someone told him he had to talk to his parents, they forgot all about that yesterday when he went to try to get out of this situation. So that is why I spent the entire day yesterday on this roller coaster ride of emotions, trying to tell myself that, of course, it's going to work out and that his brain isn't fully developed. Of course, he didn't do this intentionally. But the reality is, moms are the happiest when they are investing in their kids. And I was investing. Ooh, I was investing. Can I tell you, I got him out of bed and I was investing, Dave. And you know, when I'm yelling, my kids think it's yelling. I call it motivational speaking. And I spent a lot of time on the phone with my son yesterday. But the bottom line was he signed something. He did not know what he was signing. And he went from believing 100% that this was the best decision he could have made to the gamut of emotions coming to the other side of it, realizing that it was the worst decision that he could have possibly made. And here's the gig, friends. The biblical principles about parenting are very simple. Our kids are a gift. They are God's possession that we get to care about. They're like on loan for us for 18 years until they move out. Now, in my case, I'm still responsible for my son. But our task is to raise them up from a state of complete dependence to a state of complete 
independence. And that, my friends, is difficult. Our family and our home is supposed to be a training ground for the impartation, is that the word, of values. While we're shaping character, we're guiding spiritually, psychologically, intellectually, emotionally. It's like a full-time job, dude, and it's a full-contact sport, this whole thing about parenting. Here's the gig. We don't get to default to outside sources or institutions to do our job as parents. We are responsible for their spiritual and moral training. Period. End of story. And so I know what I want from my kid morally. What I want from him is I want him to be self-accepting and obedient. I want him to be financially responsible. I want him to respect people. I want him to be generous in his giving. And so the Bible verse says, train them up in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Dave, I'm convinced that God had a sense of humor because I think when he said when they're old, meaning while they're in college, they will. So when they're old, they will not depart from it. But in the meantime, they're departing, and it's our job to impart those things that I just talked about. So I went to this parenting, not parenting, this teenage brain class, which clearly parents were at, and I learned some things that I already knew. I was like, I was definitely empowered. I was definitely an affirmed in this class, but I was also convicted on many levels. And that's my hope for today's show. Listeners will be empowered and inspired and encouraged to engage fully in the youth in your life, but by the same token, be convicted enough to not just think about it, talk about it, but do something about it. So here's the deal. Transition from adolescence is harder for a parent, Dave, than it is for a kid. It is harder for me as a parent than it is for my son. The teen brain, friends, is still under construction. You got to go with me on this when you're looking at your kid, as I was yesterday, saying, who is this kid, why do they act that way, and what can I do about it? Now, in the past, scientists believed by age five, you're done. And, you know, that was really good because I had nannies from zero to five, so I was always planning on blaming my nannies for the raising of my children. Now I found out that the same development is happening, Dave, from 11 to 25 as it is zero to five. So we get to have this profound impact and influence on our children all the way up until age 25. The teenage brain is fully mature between ages 24 and 26. And here's now here's how scientists know that, Dave. They actually did, I don't even know, countless MRIs and watched the development of brain function and behavior as a result of brain function. And so they found that it's totally normal that kids at these ages are emotionally reactive, they're arguing, they're debating, and they're doing a whole lot of talking. You know why? Because it's necessary, Dave, for them to build the pathways from the back of their brain to the front of their brain. They're not built yet. You know what I'm saying? So they put these kids in a room and they showed them a picture of their parents' faces. And these kids totally misinterpreted what it was looking at a face that was sad versus stressed versus mad, which I was so happy about because I told you my kids always say to me, hi, what's wrong? Every time they see me, are you mad at me? What's wrong? No, that's my happy face. You just can't tell that I'm happy, right? But we have to know that even though it seems that they are combative and argumentative and totally shut down, that they are so open and they are so receptive to the things that we get to, need to, have to, and got to want to teach them. Dave, do you know how smart it is that they do not rent a car until you're 25? You cannot rent a car until you're 25. That's why. But you know what? We live in in a country that lets us drink, smoke, and go to war all before age 21. The deal with these kids is they're still kids. The risk factors for their behaviors that can have serious consequences are never ending. And their impulse control is low, Dave. You know what I'm saying? Like it's low, like they do not have control of their impulses, but they do have control of their reasoning skills. That is why my kid, I'll tell you off. Yeah, they can, and you know what? The mind can justify anything. So I could put all four of my kids in a debate and they could explain to you and articulate to you all the reasons why they should have, you know, the iPhone and everything that the friends have and they should be able to get to do everything that they don't get to do. But the chart that I looked at clearly showed the ability to reason might be visible at age 16. 
but the ability, the ability, the brain's ability to follow through on what it is that they know that they know that they know would be the right thing doesn't happen till age 24. Does that make sense? So they're virtually a race car, this powerful engine with no brakes. Sounding like your host today, I'm thinking, hello. Hey. I'm not even today and every Sunday. <laughs> So that's our job as parents or people in the lives of youth. And that is coaches, that is teachers, that is aunts and uncles. We all have an impact on these kids that are going to be the future of our country. And do we want them to be like the leaders we have now? No. Not in very many instances, my friends. I'm thinking Mr. Incognito, who's in the news right now. The Yeah, like what a drag. What a drag for the Dolphins team. What a drag for him as an individual who has not been held to a higher standard that he thought it would be okay to ever treat somebody, never mind your teammate, who you're supposed to have a common, unchanging purpose with, with any less than the dignity that they should expect. But anyway, that's a sidebar. So we get to understand that this change that's happening in our kids, in our youth, in our teenagers, is an opportunity to understand and create an environment where they can be aware of those behaviors, and more importantly, they can be aware of how destructive those behaviors can be. Okay, so the fact is, is right now you are managing a major inconvenience in your, as your child. As a parent of a child, you are managing a major inconvenience. But please know and do not doubt for one second that you are raising a human being. Let's talk about what we can possibly do to get this thing under control, this inconvenience we are raising. You are journeying with Judy right here on Lake 96.1. And shout out to Greg Kunis, who managed six or seven inconveniences, if I'm not mistaken. And they're all grown up. You are journeying with Judy. We'll be back. Okay, so they are totally... Hard to love. There's no doubt about it. The kids who need the most love will ask for it in the most unloving ways. Um, but as parents, we get to. We get to receive these kids as gift. They're on loan to us for this ex short period of time, which might seem like forever, but it's really a short period of time. And we get to have a profound impact and we all want the same things. We want our kids to be moral and flexible, respectful and accountable. We want them to be confident, have some integrity, be social and collaborative. So what does that look like in the midst of all the insanity that seems to be going on in a household with teenagers? It's because their brains are not fully developed and they won't be. So we have to have a toolbox. We have to have something that we can draw from that will help us help them become the best version of themselves. And that's where I was so empowered as a result of this teenage brain class that I took last week because they told me the difference in discipline and punishment. I, I thought they were kind of the same thing, Dave. Disciplining is a process of guiding and nurturing Punishment is just stopping the behavior. I really didn't understand that there was a clear difference between the two. So they talked about stuff like a punishment is grounding, losing technology, loss of privilege. I think I should get an award, Dave, for being the biggest punisher ever. Maybe not the best, best disciplinarian who's guiding and nurturing, but definitely the best punisher on the block. Okay. It told me, reminded me, and confirmed to me that teens crave limits and rules. Structure is vital. Talked about behavior contracts. I got those, Dave. I got them for everything. And as you can see, the kid found a loophole in my co college contract. And that's exactly right. And so obviously, Dave, there's going to be consequences. And here's the deal with consequences. It's simple. When you, then you. You're going to be teaching this to Avery when she's about two. When you, then you. When you do this, then you do that. And there's going to be natural and there's going to be logical consequences so we get to positively reinforce them Dave we talked last week about the sandwich a positive a negative a positive I just want you to know it went more like this yesterday with Carter negative 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 <laughs> negative and by the time he was saying I love you and I'm sorry because I have to tell you he felt justified and almost entitled and presumptuous where I could have crawled through the phone and choked him out at 9 a.m. and I have to say by 9 p.m. last night the text that he sent he was so humbled, and I think he was even embarrassed and ashamed, and those are never feelings I want any of my children to have. I want him to have godly sorrow and be accountable, 
and his text read something to the effect of, I'm an idiot, I'm sorry, thank you for having my back. And I wanted to say back, you're right, you are an idiot, and I'll always have your back. But instead what I said was, no, buddy, you're not an idiot. You are a young man whose brain is developing, and so I get to be your frontal lobe. I get to think for you when you are not able to. Because I don't want you to have to make restitution for something. That's part of the discipline toolbox. There's got to be restitution. You hit somebody, you hurt somebody, you got to do something nice for somebody. How about that, Dave? That's right. Yep. The biggest thing this lady conveyed was about modeling. We know that we can't discipline well if we're not well disciplined. We know that example isn't everything. It's the only thing. So we have got to lead by example. And then the last thing in this toolbox said um, patience. And so I'm just going to cross that out because that's not something that's in my toolbox. I'm hoping by the grace of God someday I will exude patience all over the place. But in the meantime, I know that I get to form the minds and hearts of my children without imposing my will upon them and knowing that their brains are still developing. And also the best thing I learned was that I get to monitor in whatever I consider safe monitoring. I get to know where they are, who they're with, what they're doing and when they're coming home. Because that would me, be me being a invested, engaged parent and I'm happiest, most happiest when I'm investing in my kid. You are journeying with Judy right here on Lake 961. We'll be back to wrap it up after the break. Okay, so now you know why I attempt to be not controlling in my kids' eyes, but detail-oriented, Dave, because we got to minimize the risks for these teenagers. As their brain is developing, we get to bend their will without breaking their spirit. And the only way I know to do that is to train them up in the way they should go. And when they're old, not including college, they will not depart from it. And if you do that and it doesn't work, you get to blame God because that's what I do, Dave. I turn it over to him, and if he blows it, I blame him. That's the way I roll. Thanks for journeying with Judy right here on Lake 96.1. This week, keep it hot, honest, open, and transparent. Peace out. <laughs>